What is the answer to life, Brendan? 42. Close. It's actually Lucky Time Explosion! <laughs> hey! Welcome back, everybody. It's Friday. I hope you're ready to have the weekend get out of work. We have a special guest today, Avalon Ashley Bellows. How are you doing? Great. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure. So you're with uh, DTR Modern right now. Yes. And we just uh, went by and checked out your um, Mr. Brainwash show. Tell yeah. us a little bit about uh, how that goes, what you do over there. What's your day-to-day -day like? Well, day-to-day, -day, you know, as I'm the executive director of media and, con and communications. So for that gallery, it means pretty much everything. As you know, with small galleries that are putting in a heavy punch, Yeah, um, you wear a lot of hats. But uh, the Brainwash show was fantastic. He came last week. We had uh, two shows back to back, if you can imagine. Oh, wow. yeah. Um, one was at the National Arts Club. Yeah, one was at the National Arts Club. Big, fancy institution that... Uh, you know, really provides a, a nice circle of collectors for you. And then we had a great after party at the gallery. So, and, and you two came. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. Are you a member of National Arts Club? I am not. I'm not either. Someone get us in. Hey. <laughs> Actually, they <laughs> opened up a couple years ago. Um, really? But my, my boss, the Ted Vasiliev, who um, is sort of like a man about town, yeah. is has been a member for many years. So I get to go and, and, and be bougie for a little bit. Yeah, um, it's nice. We have a couple of friends, so when we go, they like pull us back into the like bar we're not supposed to be in. Right, exactly, <laughs> that exclusive oak bar. Yeah, it's a nice place, though. I really like it. I, I really need to get a membership because we're so close. It's like right around the park here. For know? sure. It's like super close by. Um, so yeah, the show went well then? The show went really well. Mr. Brainwash, uh, despite his fame, is pretty humble. Yeah. He is humble. I mean, he when, seemed like a cool dude. Yeah, I mean, I went right over to him. I'm like, it's a pleasure to meet you. He was almost seemingly excited to meet me. He didn't even know me. And he's like, oh, thank you so much. I was like, this is great. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. I think it changes the game when you meet somebody that you uh, are really into and that you're inspired by and uh, they're nice. Yeah, because it can be damaging if they're not, you know, especially with bands. People run up. They want to be like, oh, you were great last night. Like, get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> and you're like, what? But I love you. They're like, and I fucking hate you. <laughs> you're like, I don't understand this. I listen to your music all the time. Like, we don't care. Who's the nicest celebrity you've ever met? Oh, man. Mine is Felicity Huffman. Really? She was super, super nice. And we were working at the movie theater and she came around and made sure to like say hi to all the employees there. All the kids there was just super sweet. So that's that's my winner. Yeah, how about you? Uh, I'm gonna have to say Vanessa Williams mm. because I acted like a complete <laughs> jerk. I, not, oh no. Just like an idiot. I was I stumbled over my words and I was super awkward. I lost all of my cool. Mm. Uh, but she's so, so kind and even more beautiful today than she was 20 years ago. Yeah, that's, that's, she is that's aging extremely cool. well. Yeah. I, uh, my, my celebrity meetup, and this is interesting because of your name, and we were talking about this before, Avalon, uh, I used to work at the Limelight. It was it called the Limelight at the time, but at the time I was there, it was called the Avalon, hey. and they had a VIP club in the top of the limelight called the Spider Club. <laughs> and when you walk up the stairs, they had like fish tanks full of like tarantulas and UV what? rays. Oh, and no. It was very fancy, no. and I, I had to watch the door for a little bit. And uh, sure enough, Dan Aykroyd comes in completely hammered. Uh, Big uh, dude. Big hands. Oh and I was God. like starstruck, you know? I was like, oh my God. He's like, hello, sir. <laughs> What's your name? I'm like, holy shit, Dan Aykroyd. He's like, that's my name. What's your name? And I was like, Morgan Lapp. And he's like, awesome. And I shook his hand. I was like, holy shit, that's so cool. And he, he walked on up. And uh, that was my Dan Aykroyd story. That is nice. I yeah. would love to meet Dan Aykroyd. What an icon. Did yes. you get one of his crystal vodkas? His crystal no, skull but vodka. have you seen his vi the, the older video when he first started with Crystal Skull Vodka and, and his whole, it's like a 20 minute video of him talking about like the aliens and the Crystal Skull. Oh, really? And it's he was it's hardcore of, like that? I thought it was oh, kind of... Oh, no, he's deep in the Crystal Skull. I actually really? did not know that was he related. Is balls deep in the Crystal Skull. <laughs> How do you get started in Crystal Skull fandom? I don't know. Some some blog online, some it's creepy kind of, forum. It's just like an attractive thing, like a, a Crystal sure. Skull. Is a, it's like a beautiful beautiful but morbid object right just want to hold it yeah uh, well crystals are cool do you remember going to the store and 
banging open those rocks oh, and there'd yeah. be a crystal inside. So I, like, could, I could get the appeal for that. You like sift through the sand to find stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how I got my start in being a crystal person. I'm kidding. I'm not really into crystals. <laughs> how did you get your start in art? Like, uh, how did you start doing art stuff and end up at a at a reputable commercial gallery that yeah. has locations around the world. Around the world. For the Paris, locations, actually. Milan. Actually, I don't know if it's in Milan. Mm. No, 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 we're not. But we are maybe possibly going to Austria, but we're in Boston, D.C., Palm Beach, and New York. That's Sometimes Nantucket for USA, the summer. USA, USA. A East Coast. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I got started. It's kind of a funny story. I was all set to be in politics. Um, when I left undergrad, I was like, I'm going to change the world. I really had that essence. Yeah. And so I went to law school at Georgetown and then I was working on the Hill and I was working for nonprofit groups, mostly based on like female rights, women's rights, marginalized societies, helping to write these wonderful bills that go across the congressional floor and never get passed. Right. Um, so I kind of realized I was on a hamster wheel. I was super depressed. Mm. DC is a lovely city, but can also be kind of a drag. And I sold a collection of my own that I was painting on oh. the side. And from there I realized like, this is how I can affect change in my own little way. That is not that too dissimilar from, you can go back in our history and see an episode with a guy named TK Mills, who now is the chief editor of a magazine. Right. Yeah. Similar, he was on track to work at the state department and had this exact kind of revelation where it's like, I can affect the world more effectively through art than politics. I'm just spinning my wheels here. Absolutely, absolutely. And I actually started working on cruise ships, so I was the one of the top female auctioneers for Park West Gallery that was traveling around the world for about six years. So it was a traveling auction on a boat? Yeah, wait a minute. It's they crazy. Have, they have art auctions on cruise ships now? Yes, what? yes. Oh. Yeah. What? So Park what, West what Gallery. What's that scene like? It's, That's got to be a weird scene, right? The cruise ship art auction. <laughs> it. You think so? so. <laughs> of course. Like. Okay. There's like a tropical band playing on the side, yeah. like like it you know, Coca Cabana. It can be kind of comical depending on the cruise ship you're on, and depending on the route you're going. Right. Like right. If you're going two sea days and back. <laughs> For like a party cruise out of Australia, out of Sydney. Right. Um that is not a luxury cruise <laughs> oh no and it's pretty hectic um there are a lot of like in australia they're nuts you know they get really really hammered and yeah what did drunk aussies buy what was the kind of art that they bought what did they like <laughs> they like uh they have this artist in australia called pro hot pro -hot? really like pro hot Who's pro hot? It, he's kind of like the Peter Max of oh. Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so they like shiny, pretty things that yeah, you know, won't won't kill their wallets, so right. to speak. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but this is like again, these are the short cruises. They're just right. there to kind of like have a good time. But the long ones have some like classy Titanic vibes. People like suiting Absolutely. up a little bit. Nice. Oh yeah, like Princess Cruise Lines. That was mm -hmm. a line I was on for a long time. That's a state of the art art program well That's you figure funny. that there's a lot of hammered people on the boat ready to just throw money down so that might be a good environment to do an auction some yeah. people just go on cruise ships to buy luxury items like diamonds mm. like art it's, i have never heard of it. yeah i mean yeah i mean i'm just i guess i'm from a different class because my uh understanding of the cruise ship passenger is the person who's like filling their suntan lotion bottle up with booze <laughs> so that they don't have to pay for the extra booze ticket there's a fair amount of that i'm yeah. not gonna lie it does keep you it keeps you on your toes but i sold some picassos goyas oh, wow. chacals that's nice. so cool that is very cool that is so cool do you yeah. have any favorite of like old master thing that you sold like somebody who's really well known i'm a kind of a goya freak mm, yeah um if i could ever sell not that um, Francis Bacon is considered a master in that I sense. Would say, I would say close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well known. I, my dream to ever sell to someone would be a Francis Bacon or a Rothko. Mm, yeah. I got to go to Rothko's studio. Have you been? No. Oh, it's open. I think it's still open. I, I don't know sure if it is actually now, but not that long ago, like maybe three years ago, they had it just open house. So you could go in and like check it out. And it's this amazing like loft apartment right off the Bowery. And it's like a really old, shitty, crusty building. And you go up inside there, and there's a um, kind of a lofted bedroom and just a huge, empty place where he was painting. You can see all the paint specs on the floor. 
and you go up there and you can imagine what it's like to live there. There was, was a there little a bar mm-hmm. at the bottom of the the building by any chance. No, I don't there think there, there wasn't a bar in there. But what was in the basement was really cool because we were like messing around, and uh, I was with Al Diaz, who's um, a guy who used to go out with Basquiat a lot. Okay. Oh and, yes, I've yeah. heard of. I've met him. I think. Yeah, he used to tag Samo, and he was the one who was like make fun of me for my Basquiat tattoo, and I'd be like, <laughs> mm, I put it behind me, <laughs> or he wouldn't make fun of me directly. He's a very nice guy. Let's get that out there. <laughs> he is. But uh, he's a super sweet dude. But he'd be like talking about you know the kids with the Basquiat tattoos, and I'm like. Oh, like what? <laughs> yeah, I, but anyway, so we went down to the bottom with Al, and uh, it there's like a pool down there, like an indoor swimming pool that's oh, now neat. abandoned. It's not filled up, but it's like you get to go walk around in the basement pool. It was very weird. That is very cool. I'm gonna look up if that's still open. Yeah, and there were little like birdies growing in the, and there's a little nest of pigeons too, which I thought oh, was quite cute. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love Rothko. <laughs> Rothko is one of those really divisive artists because of abstract expressionism and and just plain, you know minimalism yeah but if you stand in front of a large rothko it changes you i used to be a rothko naysayer as well oh yeah for sure I, yeah i was i tried to understand it more and you know the more i get it like the more i like it the the more i see them yeah really they, they do grow on you because he's playing with very simple things just horizon line and color exactly and those have like a subconscious um like triggers for us you know like we see red we get mad uh, you see the horizon line low, you're like happy or something. Yeah. So well, that, there's that famous saying where like that woman was standing in front of it and just started bawling her eyes out. Was that like, was Ooh. me. That was me. <laughs> and then he goes, you get it. <laughs> you understand my painting, what I'm trying to do here. Now cry into my hand so I can use your tears. <laughs> <as paint." laughs> what kind of makes, what kind of work did you make? You said you sold, you started off selling your own yeah. paintings. Do you still make art? I want to it's, it's so busy. badly. You're it's, busy. Trust me, I know that one. Oh my god, this podcast. This podcast is my painting now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You get an outlet, but it's it's tough. Um, I used to do highly stylized nudes, mm. and I used to connect it with this idea of like what I called uh, neo feminism. Neo feminism. So yeah. it's like beyond third wave feminism. I think so. I. Is it fourth, fifth wave? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It just basically like empowers women through femininity. Like, right. You know, so, because for so long, like femininity and feminism was built to be against each other. Mm. Um, and actually, I don't think that's true. Yeah. And that's an interesting way to look at it. I, I, you know, there's always that talk of like toxic masculinity as a man. I have to deal with that kind of stuff all the time. I think I was lucky where I didn't really have like I had very nice People thought my parents were like hippies, but they really weren't. They were just chill. They're just good old <laughs> Texas folk. Yeah, they let me. Um, they let me be homeschooled from the fifth grade. Oh, so nice. So I dropped out of school in the fifth grade, and I just like grew up with them around the house, and they were very supportive, and I didn't like have that kind of middle school soul crushing experience. And, I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Me too. So I didn't get that like ta- I didn't feel like that need to be so masculine. Like I didn't feel that pressure, and so it, it's funny. Like now I kind of like. I'm like, yeah, toxic masculinity is awesome. Like, ironically, because I'm actually very in touch with my sensitive side. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't you have know. to deal with getting booked. Yeah. Didn't you didn't have like... to deal with getting pantsed. Yeah. Pants. You didn't have to deal with getting the zombie. <laughs> what's the zombie? What's the zombie? Yeah, what's the zombie? Yeah. It's when someone is standing there and they're, they're behind you and they reach down and pull your nuts back. And when you make the face after you get your balls pulled back, you make a face like you look like a zombie. <laughs> So they call that the zombie. Where God. did you go to school? Yeah, with Rikers say. or what's going on? <laughs> Let me know what district Monroe that is Monroe Woodbury avoid. in uh, Orange County, New York. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, and also, you know, you get new shoes. Everyone tries to, you're like, hey, I got new shoes. And everyone's trying to stomp in your fucking shoes. Oh, my right. God. And you know what? That 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 brings us to, to an interesting thing here. Why? Is it? Oh, no. Um, is it holiday time? It's what gonna holiday mess is you it? up. But guess what? What? This is the one day without shoes. Take off your socks, go about your day, and raise awareness about the holiday. Wait, wait, wait. How stinky your fucking toes smell. <laughs> wait, Wednesday was no socks day. It can't be no shoes day on Friday. What? This is just more proof that uh, holidays are out of control. Out of control. control. But There's, There's, not too many great ones. Ones. There's not too many great ones. Oh, National Public Gardens Day. That's cute. Public Gardens Day? Public Gardens Day. Mm. Um, National Golf Day for all you golfers out there. Yeah. <laughs> Hardcore. I was forced to play golf as a kid. Like, not forced, but like, because I was homeschooled, my parents were like, you need to do stuff. Right. So I like covered the entire WASP after school activity gamut. I did karate, soccer, tennis, golf, 
hockey. You ever try to combine all of them? Yeah, actually, we did. We played something called full contact golf. <laughs> did you really? What? Yeah, it was awesome, actually. Oh, <laughs> so full contact golf is the you dress up in a full like um, football like shoulder pad and like a helmet Dumb. and like you get you get basically armored out with like every kind of armor that exists uh for sports then you take the the, the golf carts you're allowed to do pit maneuvers on the golf carts and like try to spin them out and then the idea is basically you don't wait turns everybody just tries to get their ball in as fast as possible and you can tackle and you can hit people with the golf club that so that's all the armor. is amazing why is this not more popular than normal golf seriously uh, probably all the concussions uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. well they're making a lot of changes <laughs> the state to football. had to step in and shut us down football the next year is going to be very strange you can't like uh grab people's legs anymore like certain tackles you can't do so it's it's going to be a little bit more of an offensive game. Mm. Um, but, of course, all the people who play a defensive role in football are pissed. They're like, well, what else are we supposed... How are we supposed to get the guy down now? Also, like, you, you can't, like... You can't change football. It's, it's been around too long. Yeah, but they're all worried that, you know, all the concussions and all that stuff. So they're There's trying to protect the worried. players. And it is crazy, but it's going to completely change the game. I was never a football person. I was more baseball and... yeah. And MMA. 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 That's hardcore. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I, did, I did karate. Karate. Um, so you studied like politics. At, uh, so did you ever study art? Like making art? Studio art? No. Nice. I never studied art. I just grew up. My mom always took me to museums. We always had, you know, eye carts and Picassos, not the real ones. Just, um, you know, beautifully hung in our house. So I was always surrounded by art. Mm. So, so natural pro proclivity, proclivity. Yeah, yes. I got that one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, similarly, my parents both, I think I have the genes for it, but neither of them really explored it. My dad was, um, he probably could have been a musician, but he didn't feel the need to learn more than three chords on the guitar. He's like, I got a G, C, and D, I'm good. That's like uh, the misfits. Facts. Yeah, and then <laughs> my mom, um, you know, came from a really rough uh, upbringing with like 11 brothers in the deep south brushing her teeth with uh, twigs and shit. What? So she uh, was like, I don't, she's too money insecure to really follow creating art as a school. So she did architecture instead, but really amazing stuff. She should have been a painter. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't really, I studied art, but like at junior college, cause I dropped out in fifth grade and I went back and I went to a place called College of Marin that has a bronze foundry for a junior college, which is crazy. Really cool. And so they did a bunch of stuff. Oh, they used to have this um, cutout cause Robin Williams went there. So I had this cutout cardboard of him in the drama room and I would go up to take a piss and it would scare the pants off me every time. <laughs> cause it's just Robin Williams like sitting, sitting through the window. Oh, he's one celebrity I met too. I used to work at a grocery store in Marin, and uh, he was in the cheese aisle, like shopping for cheese, and I was oh, mopping the God. floor. What an and icon! I decided to mess with him, so I went up to him and I was like, "Do you know who you are?" <laughs> and in classic Robin Williams, you know, he's like, hey, hmm, "I think so." <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> nah, no, nah, no. Yeah, and then I was like, oh, "I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'll leave you alone now. Sorry." <laughs> what a fabulous memory, though. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was a good spot. That's cool. Uh, art, yeah, art, uh, doing art and studying it seem like almost arbitrary now. It's like, I feel like we got a lot of attention on people who are not classically trained. Absolutely. And I think that all kind of goes with like the this vast like push for democratizing art, with street art and all of these other things. It's right. kind of become um, a platform for everyone to sort of express their creativity and their genius. Um, it's hard to find a really, really good up and coming artist these days. Wouldn't you agree with that? Actually, kind of. I was going to say, like, um, you know, and this is actually kind of on point for the Mr. Brainwash show, too, because if you've watched the show, I mean, the movie, right? Uh, you know, Escape from Escape from Escape from the <laughs> gift shop. Get the fuck out. <laughs> no, uh, uh, if you watch Exit Through the Gift Shop at the end, Banksy's kind of saying, you know, I wouldn't encourage people to make art anymore because of what happened with Mr. Brainwash. Right. But I think he earned his stripes by going out there with everybody for so long. I've been following this you know? one artist. He's, he's pretty amazing. Uh, his name is Morgan Jesse Lappin. <laughs> <laughs> does some amazing shit, I gotta say. And he's so handsome, so too. Good. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. such a humble dude. He's a good guy. Modest. <laughs> Modest. He's a, he's a good kid. Yeah. But no, but on, on that, about like finding good artists and, and what is a good artist and, and democratizing the art world, I used to work at Con Artist Collective on in Ludlow, which was around from like 2010 to 2020 ish. Mm -hmm. And it had a good reputation, but it was like a street art gallery kind of. And one of the funny things was, you know, I had that very much that mentality when I first got to New York that 
you know, Brooklyn was super cool. Manhattan was for yuppie scum. Uh, the street art was cool. Main galleries are stuck up and lame. Uh, and then I was working at the street art gallery and I started being like, you know, my kingdom for an MFA grad to talk to because these street artists were actually more dramatic and clicky and, and true, like, yeah. you know, really, really kind of pretentious. And I experienced way more of that. They were like, I'm not going to be in the show if this guy's in the show. We have beef. And I'm like, okay, like, um, <laughs> can you give me a list every Thursday of who you're mad at now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then I had artists complain to me like, this person went over me. And I'm like, you guys are doing graffiti. Like, just do it. Yeah. Don't. I, you know, it, it's so important that artists, the, the artists that I, we try to work with are people that are really kind. Yeah. Um, I think that's important. And back to Mr. Brainwash. Yeah. One of the kindest artists, every artist that came, up and coming artist that came to the event, spoke to him he gave them words of encouragement he did everything he could to like uplift a lot of the the young artists that were in the room right yeah i found that to be very important i, f I felt that vibe and it made made you feel special yeah you know, it made you feel like part of his crew absolutely like you're welcome you know I yeah like that and you know he he yes i mean he basically borrows he calls himself the great appropriator right, <laughs> right. he's not shy about that yeah um, but I would say there's like a that. collective pop culture history. It's happy. People want happiness in their homes. I think he kind of represents to me like a nice in cap on street art. Yeah. You know what I mean? Kind of like the move, like, cause it is, is sort of like, it's changing a lot now, you know, street art is becoming less, um, about graffiti, less about writing yeah. like graffiti writers. Now we actually really, we do this like extreme separation between street art and writers right you're either a graffiti writer who just does the art form of right lettering and and getting up all, everywhere and then you have these people who do like a mural that's you know can can commissioned by the wall owner yeah and, and they call themselves street artists and it starts to get muddied uh and the aesthetic too you know the aesthetic is definitely like changing uh more different aesthetics are bleeding into street art and like mural stuff absolutely so he kind of i feel like mr brainwash is just taking all of all of street art and graffiti history and just like being like here you go there you go there it is and we love it yeah what do you think about like the changing like this is an interesting conversation i want to see if we can squeeze it into the seven minutes we have left um democratizing art gatekeeping uh you know when's it good when's it bad because the more i get into it like I make a joke now about like I'm, I want to have you know call something like gatekeeper gallery <laughs> and just like be unashamed about and I gatekeeping. The key yeah, because <laughs> like gatekeeping is a weird thing. It's like you know it, there is some of it, you see the value of it as a curator because right. that's kind of your whole job is right. to be like this is what's good. I'm going to bring this to you and present it and elevate it. So yeah, what I you think th you need both at, at all times, and I think that the important part about art for me is the story behind the piece, the story behind the artist. Um, and so connecting people in that way is important. And to be honest, we do live in a capitalist society. So yeah. there has to be value put on that. There has to be like art is an asset. So yes, I think it's important to gatekeep in some ways, uh, but I don't like to limit my artist. I don't like to tell them, oh, you can't work with this. You can't do this right. because they're part of this hustle as well. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a tough question to answer because I think both of them are important. It should be democratized. I want everyone to feel like they can collect because mm -hmm. you can. Right. Um, but also, you know, the higher end is higher end for a reason. Right. Yeah. And sometimes those reasons can be, uh, confusing or not visible. And then people like to make a lot of assumptions about oh why something's God. popular. <laughs> well, in my gallery, you can hear everyone's words outside i can hear what everyone says and people walk up oh, like, nice. oh that's a knockoff this and that's a knockoff that and you're oh, like yeah. why don't you come in here and say this to my face yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah totally yeah it's like people have a lot of silly things it just reminded me of like i was in uh san francisco and there's this building that has these like support structures and this guy i don't know why this is such a weird it's not even worth telling but i'm gonna have to now because <laughs> we're in it this guy was looking at the building the trans am building and he goes those are like flying buttresses <laughs> about the support beams and i'm like no they're not and like i don't know it bothered me all day i, I was know like, those are flying not flying buttress buttresses it's because when you're in school and you learn about a flying buttress you don't forget about what a flying buttress is <laughs> it's not flying and flying indicates it's off the building Anyway, so that, that, that bothered me for years. Such a random thing. I mean, of course, say. when I first heard that word, I'm the same thing when I heard Lake Titicaca. 
You yeah, know, right. man, I couldn't handle myself. You but you know, start shooting milk buttress, out your nose. I just see this like maid with this big butt, on, uh, like flying through the sky. Nice. She's For like, the ah! buttresses, okay. Yeah. But we're talking about Titicaca. I got confused. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I, I have ADHD. I'm, I'm like a. <laughs> I got you. Though. That's how. Machine. That's how we keep the show moving. Is your 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 crippling disability of ADHD. That's makes how I the picture my faster. brain. Like I see a, a pinball machine yeah. in my head. It's like bing bong bong. Bing boom. <laughs> okay. A lot Avalon. of lights, flashy colors, and sounds. <laughs> Avalon, what is next for you? What is coming up? What What do you, do you have anything to plug? Do you have any exciting stuff in the works? Uh, yeah, we're working on this new project called Divine Feminine. Um, so it's really focusing on uh, female artists, women artists, and uh, from marginalized societies. We're doing a whole gala, hopefully, in the fall. Nice. Um, but it's going to be fully sponsored. Um, an elevated space. So that's coming in June. We're doing a sit down dinner and then the gala will be in the fall. Um, and then other than that, we're just, uh, we're working with Halim Flowers, a, an artist that I'm very passionate about. Again, the storytelling, right? Mm. Um, he has some Basquiat influence, but you know, spent 22 years wrongfully in prison. And the last five wow. years that he's been released has done so much TED Talks, MoMA exposition, et cetera. Exhibition. 20 years falsely 22 in prison. years, yeah. Can you imagine just then, like, how angry are you when they I'm, come 20 I'm, years later and go, oopsies. Oops, you know, oopsies we should have not bad. imprisoned you when you were 16 years old. Right. Fuck, but, man, that's terrible. But what's interesting about this in terms of, like, art is when I spoke to him in the beginning, I asked him his relationship with color, mm. which he said was completely distorted because of those 22 years. Mm. Yeah. Imagine that makes that. a lot of sense. You're just looking at like freaking concrete all day. Everything's gray. Your eyes got your receptors probably start dying off if you don't use them. Exactly. That's wild. Um, okay, I gotta ask for everyone for everyone listening because I feel like a lot of people who listen are artists themselves, mm -hmm. and we're talking about like gatekeeping and galleries and all this. How like let people can you it, let people know how you guys find your artists? This will help you not be bothered by them coming in <laughs> with their portfolios. That will never cease. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's never going to stop, but you guys got to you gotta gotta knock it off. Yeah. I like, we love the hustle, but it's just like instant shutdown for most people. You know. I, yeah, I'm usually quite bubbly, and I turn into the opposite when that happens. Yeah, you're like, oh. You're like, oh, great. Yeah. Um, so I think the best thing to do, I love receiving portfolios via email. Hmm. Um. But we really very, to be honest, very rarely find artists that way. Right. It's usually like their Instagram, we stumble upon it or mm. word of mouth. Um, and it's always trying to find somebody that's doing something new and innovative in some facet. Right. Which is difficult. Yeah, definitely. And I always tell artists like as a, when I'm talking about to an artist about how to relate to galleries, how to talk to galleries, I'm always like, you know, let me know. I, basically, I want to test this and see if you think this is good advice or if I'm off base on something. Okay, great. What I tell them is I say, look, if you want to get to know a gallery, you know, if you want to get, you want to show a gallery your work, they're going to instantly shut down when you're trying to present yourself as an artist. So if you have a show elsewhere, go there to the gallery, enjoy their show, talk to them about that art, make sure it's a place you really want to be in, and then invite the people to come to your show if they want. Yes. Uh, and the other thing I say is, um, you know, get somebody else to advocate for you. Don't send an email yourself saying, look at my portfolio. Get yeah. like somebody else to say, hey, have you seen this artist? This is really cool. Uh, and I think some people take that to an extreme and like make up fake identities and like make up a fake email. And they're like, I get a couple of those. I think we have one in our email for the podcast right now. They're oh. like, this dude is the hottest hip hop act in all the city. And I'm yeah, like, I, I don't think like you those. wrote this. I don't think I like when they have a promoter. Mm, okay. So, yeah. But I do think it's right to come to the gallery. First of all, look around. Yeah. Will you fit in on these walls? Right. And number two, yeah, start inviting me. I've had people. The, actually, the, the woman that I'm working with for the Divine Feminine was an artist that hounded me for a year and a half. There you go. Yeah. So it does happen, but yeah. it does take a, a long time because we are busy. You're busy? Yeah. So the most important advice, just be cool, guys. Be cool. Chill out a little bit. Be cool. Show up and actually engage. Don't Be, be true to yourself. That's yeah. the thing. Be authentic. All right. That's awesome. Okay. Well, we got to lead out. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a lovely me. Friday. We hope maybe we'll have you back sometime and we'll definitely see you at the next DTR show. And don't forget to subscribe. Oh, yeah. Like. Check out the Patreon. 
Become a lucky timer. Pew, pew. And see you next time. Links for DTO and Avalon in the description. Bye. Bye. Lucky time explosion.